And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster that is currently developing the crowned TTRPG. All about characters getting the mantle of godhood. So, make all your ego jokes, I'm pretty sure, we're, I'm pretty sure we've heard them all before. In the red corner, we have... We have, we have game designer and cat wrangler Damon Va Damon Vanhee. And in the blue corner, we ha we have his partner in crime, Sarah Moore. How we how we doing tonight? Doing good. good. How are you? Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks thanks for coming on. Um, I've joked about this whenever I whenever I have um um two two person teams for for these kind of things. Which one do you use the abbot and which one do you use the Costello? Oh hmm. gosh, what a hard question. <laughs> um, I'll say I am the abbot purely because my name is first alphabetically. That's fair. Yeah, although I do feel like I play um, the straight man to you quite a bit. That's true. That's true. Oh. Uh, so the. And of course, the next question is, who's the tank? Mm. Oh, mm. that's interesting. Because um, I typically play spellcasters, and Sarah typically plays rogues. No, so no, 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 no. neither of us. No no no. <laughs> no, no, no. Who is the tank? Sarah. That's fair. No. <laughs> Who is the tank? I think it's me. I think it's me. No, who you know? Who's the tank? What's the mage? I don't know. Who's the priest? Oh, oh I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't. I'm with you it, now. I'm with you. Yeah, don't take it too hard. I do that to everybody <laughs> because that's that's the kind of show that this is. There. Some. Yeah. Some places are for deep philosophical discussion on game design and game theory. We are not. We here in the monastery are not that kind of show. We are a bunch of jerks who like, who like games and drinking. Sometimes. I mean, we like those things. That's fine. <laughs> and and um, and and la and laughing whenever whenever somebody botches. Yeah, that's fair. Because, tra in the words of Mel Brooks, tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. He was full of gems like that. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's always funny when it happens to somebody else. So, yeah, I'd like to open up with the origin story. Um, how did both of you first get into TTRPGs and what made it stick? Go ahead, For Damon. Me, okay, I'll go first. For me, uh, I started very young. Um, my mom ran me through my first D&D game when I was about six years old. Um, and I just played from then on. I come from a, from a very game positive family, you know, board games, card games, RPGs. Uh, so I've just been playing games since I was a really, really little kid. Um, my, all of my siblings play games, my parents, stuff like that. So, uh, it kind of always stuck like right, right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I, um, we started, pretty young in my house i i watched first i had a, a older brother who was four years older than me and so he, when i was very small he and his friends would play D D, and so i got to observe first mm -hmm. uh and then and then i started playing myself um but when i was a little bit older and and i i don't i don't think there was a moment when it stuck we're just like i'm a very heavy storytelling background and and i think rpgs are really great for that and so it's sort of always been there for me mm -hmm. uh, i i do have to get this gag out of my system i do i do consider um inflicting jenga on anybody to be a form of 
torturing non-combatants. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I've played a lot of Jenga in my life, mostly at pubs. Yeah. Oh god! Oh god! Jen Jenga when everybody's had a few drinks. That's that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, which uh, which I guess is kind of the point of the game, to be honest. But yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, then again, I've called Monopoly a a Viking death march. So what do I know? You're not far off on that, though. That is a family ender right there. Yeah. Oh, I've I've always I've always laughed whenever some whenever somebody ta um looks at looks at um TTRPGs or even certain board games as being too complicated because I have the misfortune of have of trying to play the campaign for North Africa. If you have seen the board for that, you know why I say misfortune. Because, <laughs> and that is a game that has started fights. <laughs> but it's one it's one of those it, it's one of those infamous board games because of how massively huge it is, and and it it would take several hundred hours to finish. Right. Because it, because it was one of those we need to make things as real as realistic as possible, kind kind of games that were that were all over the place in the seventies. Uh, of course, of course, there's there's always this infam in there. There's always this infamous image which I'm going to share with bo with both of you, that shows how big the game board is. The child there oh, is, just for, is just for size reference. Yeah, it's <laughs> very large. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, when now when it comes to the when it comes to the crown, uh, when I was going through the the quick start material that you guys had sent me, there were two things that were that were at the that were at the forefront of my mind. Um. One of them, just just in the non TTRPG form, was the Sandman. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who's made that comparison. You are not. No, you are not. <laughs> it's it's de definitely a definitely a solid influence for this. The other is Exalted. Mm -hmm. uh, were both were both of those major influences and. How did the how did the idea for the crown come to be? Um, Sandman definitely has has a lot of influence uh, on the crown for sure. Mostly, I was I was looking for um, a game that could give the players as much freedom and agency to do whatever they wanted if they were gods. And a lot of the the god games that I found out on the market just didn't really fit for kind of what I uh, wanted to do and the stories that I wanted to tell. Um, but it's, it's you know, I, I have been very fortunate to have the uh, one of the same gaming groups for uh, almost two decades at this point. And so we've played a lot of stuff over the years. Um, and, and even when we had tried to play gods in various games, be it, Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, Nobilis or anything like that. Um, or even if we homebrewed something, uh, it always felt a little um, rigid, I think. And so with the crown, my my intent was to write something that that would allow a player to really feel what it is like to get to be a god of a, a small section of reality. Yeah, but you left out the fun part of that it was originally going to be a novel, and then you abandoned the novel because plot is dumb, and instead you just had, like, a delightful world you had built, and suddenly we were playing in the game instead of yeah, that's instead of finishing the too. novel. Yeah, that's, that's a thing, too. Yeah, I started I started several years ago with a NaNoWriMo book, um, and uh, wrote about 80,000 words and realized that it wasn't really a story, but I had about 80,000 words worth of world building that I could use. So I just swapped that over to a game world and then tried a few systems for it. Couldn't find any of that fit. And then eventually just wrote my own. Mm -hmm. Which you are in good company when it comes to that kind of thing. 
And part what I do find kind of amusing is that is putting out putting out that kind of god game is in a very stark contrast to a to a narrative that that I see with a, I see with a lot of people in fantasy games. That being um if that being being too powerful is is some sort of is some sort of disadvantage and we, and you need to make things as low powered as possible when it comes to what the players can do in order to make things not too easy and then here here you guys come along with a full on god game <laughs> yeah 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 and it, and it was you know it that was definitely one of the the challenges from a design angle because if you're going to give a player that much power, how do you keep the balance throughout the game, you know? Um, and still make it fun and still give the the characters a story and still give them, you know, like a journey that they can go on and things that they can explore and growth that they can experience. Um, so you still, you know, you can still begin as as small gods, I guess you could you could call them. Um, but within the thing that you are the god of, that's your, we call that your purview in the game. Within your purview, you really do have full god powers to do whatever it is that you want. Mm -hmm. Now, speak, speaking of, speaking of that, when it comes to, when it comes to, when it comes to, um, character creation, um, would it be fair of me to say that it that it is fair it is fairly freeform? You're picking your you're picking your at you're picking your aspect and and credo, but be, and everything else is um, o open season. Uh, sort of. So you you know your your big main thing that you're picking is what your purview is. So what your little slice of reality is, whether that's like bubblegum or volcanoes or frogs or whatever it is that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you pick uh, one of the ruling pantheon that you are bonded to, like if you essentially, you know, that they're your boss, <laughs> basically, sort of, um, they are much more powerful than you. And because you are bonded to them, you get a couple of of things automatically like they they are sort of your character class. Mm -hmm. So we don't have rogues and wizards and monks. We have um gods bonded to one of our 10 clade members mm -hmm. and then you have a certain number of points to work with and you get to pick um something that we call wonders which is sort of like all the other stuff that you can do as a god uh we don't have spells we don't have have cantrips we we have these things called wonders that you can like you know, some of them will let you hover, and some of them will uh, give your character wings, and some of them uh, allow you to have an extra limb. It's uh, just sort of buying those as, as character upgrades, but there is a list. You can't just choose anything. <laughs> yeah, and the wonders also cover all of your gear that you might have, you know, so all of your weapons and armor, things along those lines, those all count as wonders as well. So really, once you've chosen... The, your purview and chosen uh, which member of the clade you're an aspect of. Um, beyond that, you get to build the rest of your character pretty a la carte. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to purview, because of how broad purview can be, in the full book, do you have plans on putting it aside to uh, as far as far as what as far as what might be a better idea than others when it comes to purview and what and what kind of purviews might be pushing it um so i guess yes and no so part of part of the, there's definitely going to be guidelines for the storyteller in the in the full book for for how to handle different purview choices from the players but sort of the point of the game is to let the players pick kind of what they want to pick and just sort of roll with it you know um the thing that we added to balance things out is uh, when you're performing a rote, which is your divine spell, essentially, mm -hmm. um, in order to make those things happen, they all come out of a thing called an aether pool, which is a, a fixed point pool that all of the players have at the same amount. 
um, you have your individual pool, but like everyone at the table has the same amount. So uh, it means that you could have the god of like coffee stir sticks and the god of splitting atoms at the same table, and they would have the same power potential in their aether pool. So it it really comes down to how a player can use their purview in a clever way to solve problems and overcome obstacles and challenges and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's not so much that any purviews are outside the limitations. We tried really hard not to put any limitations in the game. It's really all about how you can work those purviews into the game in a way that helps tell the story and advance the narrative. Yeah. Now, one of the bit, one of the big avenue, one of the big steps I noticed with character creation is the choice of aspects. Which would it be fair of me to say that aspects aren't far removed from a archetype? Um. So those are your those are your character classes essentially right there. So if you if you are um, the thought process behind it is your purview is going to be somewhat related to the multiple purviews that the ruling pantheon have. So if you take like we'll take Capital for example. Capital is one of the the ruling pantheon members. Um he is in charge of things like cities and you know neighborhoods, infrastructure, uh trains, timekeeping, things along those lines. So if you're playing a character whose purview is related to those things like trash bins or gutter water or glass um you might then be an aspect of capital you are like a small little facet of the things that that he already controls um so that's how those function those those are taking the place of our our character classes mm -hmm. and the cool thing about those is depending on how the game goes like the 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 clade are very active gods within the world you know they they interact with the citizens in the city and and all kinds of stuff so it's it's very possible that if if your bonded clade member is not pleased with some of the things that you're doing they might swap you to another one kind of trade you around like baseball cards yeah and will you be providing guidance as far as as far as what the what sort of things the clade like or don't or don't like they're bond they're bonded to be doing Oh sure, yeah. yeah. There's a there's mm -hmm. a lot of description about the the clade members. You know, in the full book, we you have the quick start. Mm. Um but in the full book, there's each entry on the clade members are, are much longer. There's a, a lot of history and lore within the, the clade, and we try to give as much as possible so that people can make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm guess I'm guessing in that same in that same vein there there may be there may be some guidance as far as appearance to ref, to reflect the purview to reflect certain purviews. You mean as far as um what the clade would be would be doing around certain characters purviews? More more of uh, more of providing a few examples of of per, of purviews and how how a care and how how to how to have that purview carry over into a character's appearance? Oh um, yeah, definitely. There's definitely stuff for that. Like we, um, the the stronger you become as a god, um, the more your purview manifests physically. So that could uh, that could be um, you know like on your skin or in the environment around you. You know, it could be like your bones changing. All kinds of different stuff. Most of it is is up to the player, as as much of the things are. But we'll definitely have you know examples and maybe some random tables and things like that to to help guide you. And we have we have some art already done that will be in the book. That is example of characters that people have played in our playtesting sessions that have their purview sort of manifested around them. Mm -hmm. Now. When it comes to when it comes to the core mechanic, I did notice that you get that you guys are doing a attribute plus skill d6 die pool. So I yeah. do have to ask the question: How many pounds of d6s do you have? So many. 
pounds. Yeah. At least my body weight. Good answer. <laughs> uh, I'm just say I'm just saying anyone who says that you that they have enough dice is a liar. Yeah, exactly. I feel I feel that very strongly. Um and it does it doesn't exactly hurt doesn't exactly hurt that it's easy to get it's easy to get dice by the pound these days. For sure. Although I had I had some I had some dice that I had that I had asked to get made that were um mirror written. So the, mm. the numbers are upside down and backwards. Oh nice. Uh oh. It was it was a way to it was a way for me to roll in front of everybody without them actually knowing what I rolled. Mm -hmm. Cuz the because I didn't have I didn't have a um I didn't have a GM screen set up quite yet. So my mindset was if I can't do that then make it so that they they can see what die I'm rolling, they just can't read it. Yeah. Those are right. tricky to, to Man, those sound great. I want dice like that now. <laughs> oh. Un it's unfortunate that I ended up lo I ended up losing them a, a long time ago because I I liked messing with people with those, but yeah, for sure. One of the things that wasn't in the quick start, and I'd like to get I'd like to get a bit more um, insight on is credos. Yeah, so credos are uh, those are going to be in the full book, and those are um, closer to the archetypes that that you had mentioned before those are going to be um some some optional things that you can choose at character creation that are going to uh function as sort of role play guidelines you know general general outlooks towards uh divinity in general and towards the city and technology and things along those lines um so there will be 10 of those as well because there's 10 of everything in the book um but yeah we we have those are not in the the quick start guide, but they will be in the full book for sure. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to rotes, given the given the amount of stuff that can be d that can be done with um, rotes and the and the whole the the fact that it's essential that for all intents and purposes it's a build a spell system. Yep, it is. In the full book, do you have plans for a few example rote effects? That build, yes. that build upon that sort of that sort of thing, so people aren't completely um, flying blind with it. Yeah, absolutely. the The playtest that we, uh, the quick start guide that we have right now was one that we really just put together so we could run games at conventions. Um, you know, so it it and because we printed out a lot of them to hand out to our playtesters, so we were really uh, um, tight on on space. So it's mostly just the core mechanics that's there. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely have uh, guides for how roads work and um, some examples of of some great ones that we've had during the course of gameplay too. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, one particular question I can see people asking is the kind of story the kind of story seeds that you'd set up when you're de when you're dealing with a party of gods, because obviously you can't do the you all meet in a tavern kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, you you can. There certainly are taverns in in our setting, um, but yeah, you you don't have to. And and you become a god. You were not always a god. You were gifted this mantle hood of of godness, and you can like <laughs> like you could have known all of these people just as people beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and you can you can do if you want to do the hand wave of like. The the three or four of you gods have worked together before, you know that's that's totally fine if that's easier. But you can you can meet each other through divine things. I think it's really fun to be able to role play, like stumbling upon someone's ritual or something of that nature, and then and then suddenly you like recognizing each other as divine presences. Mm -hmm. And in that re in that regard. Um, what sort of what sort of impetuses for for adventuring have you used when when doing quick starts at at um conventions?
Uh, so well, we, we have. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, sorry, Darren. No, no, go ahead, Sarah. Sarah, you ran the Met conventions. You go ahead. Um. So we had two different modules that we wrote prior to going to the conventions. Um. And one of them was getting a job from like a, a local corporation. Uh, a re- a retrieval job. It's easier to send gods in to retrieve something dangerous than it is to send squishy mortals in. Uh, and then the other one was that there was just like some trouble of people disappearing in a neighborhood and um, and you were tasked by another minor god to go find them. Mm-hmm. Make sure that everything was okay. Um I think one of the coolest things about this particular game is that it supports really big, broad, world-changing stories, but it also supports very, very small, intimate... Like, it won't matter to more than one person kind of stories. Um, And so you, you can do the same when you're building your jobs or your encounters for the night... You don't have to think outside of how you would be developing a game in another system. It can still work. You can still take a job from somebody who's looking for help in a big way or like, hey, I need you to go. go something was stolen from me and I need you to go find it. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, the other... One of the other things I I, f- I found interesting when it came to the um, ca- when it came to the character sheet is putting is putting aside a spot for worshippers. Yes. And how and how w- obvious obviously it, it could obviously that could be the p- part of me could see that as um as this game's version of contacts. But I'm guessing that there's more. There's more to it than just than just people the character knows. Yeah, correct. There's um. So that section is on there for to kind of cover the spread for different like flavors of role player. Um. There's the uh, aether pool that I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Um. That regenerates uh on a daily basis, but it doesn't regenerate all the way. You only get a little sliver back each day. But in the Wonders section, there's a, a bunch of Wonders that you can take that have the Worshipper tag on them. Um, and when you take those, if you have more Worshippers, you regenerate more Aether on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So some players I know are going to be very interested in who those Worshippers are and how they interact with their character and the other characters at the table and in the city and things like that. And then some players just aren't going to care about that. Um, it says in there you can you don't need to pay any attention to your worshipers for them to give you the mechanical benefit so if you if you want you can be very involved in their lives and and you know have your your storyteller come up with with um um plots and intrigue that involves them or you can simply take the mechanic gain the extra aether per day and ignore the fact that they exist entirely I think as we how we worded in there is basically they will worship you whether or not you pay attention to them. So any anyone can gain the benefit of having that wonder. Um but we we put the worshiper section on the character sheet um just so you've got a little area to keep track of who they might be and where they might worship things like that. Mm-hmm. Now speak going further when it comes to details on the character sheet, I do want to ask about rituals. And is that how similar or different would that be to Rotes? Sarah, you want to take this one or you want me? Uh, yeah, so rituals are, I mean, the easiest way to describe them, I think, is that they are just really big rotes that take much longer to do. Um, rituals can have multiple gods all contributing their divine uh essence or divine power into it and it can take you know several days uh up up to several years like you could be running a campaign if it's a a big long ongoing campaign where your players are are feeding into a ritual for you know 
six months of gameplay before it can trigger. Um, and it also allows you to do things that are further away from your purview. Rotes are are fast. They're like the real quick ones that you can shoot off in one round of combat, right? You're you're able to just sort of reflexively know how to do things. With rituals, you have to sit and build and construct with other gods' help, um, and you're able to do bigger things that are farther from your regular sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And I'm get and I'm guessing that much much like with what I mentioned about rotes, there's uh, there there's going to be a few examples of rituals in the full in the full book. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are, Definitely. Is there also going to be a system in pl in place, uh, much in the same way that there is with um, with rotes and degrees, when it comes to how when it comes to how to build rituals? Yeah, there will be there's there's a set of rules for those, and and we'll have examples and and things like that too. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that in mind. I do. I. I see. I look when I look at the skills. I see. I see a bit of a blank spot under under each skills. Are you planning on allowing for a specialization rule when it comes to skills? Yeah, there is one in there. Um, and and basically how those work is when you're when you're doing a challenge roll. Uh, and you're using, you know, that dice pool of D6s that we talked about earlier. You, you'll be rolling a stat plus a skill to figure out what your pool is. Uh, and then when you roll the dice, fives and sixes count as successes. And you're trying to hit a target number of successes. Um, and then sixes explode, meaning you get to re-roll them for, you know, possible bonus action. If you re-roll that die, you get a five or a six. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an additional success. Uh, in our game, um, the sixes continue to explode forever if you keep rolling sixes. Um, but when you have a skill specialization, on your very first roll, your fives also explode. So you really have the potential to to exceed the... the. You can get more successes than what you even have in your dice pool. I've seen players with a dice pool of only four or five get nine and ten successes with the exploding dice, and especially with a skill specialization. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to talk, I do want to talk about the, about the set, about the setting, the Shining Garden. Um, is the, is the intent of the Shining Garden to be kind of, to be kind of this, um, metropolis-like city of the gods? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a it's a vast mega city. It's densely, densely populated. Lots of skyscrapers. You know, millions and millions of people. There are millions of gods in the city. Um, millions of humans. Uh, just you know, uh, going about their their regular lives. It's like it's like any any densely populated city you can think of. New York, Hong Kong, kind of has elements of all of those. Um, and then at the very heart of it is the Citadel, which is where um, Fetch, who is the god of all gods and the eldest of the clade, and he is also the one that gifts divinity to um, the players. Um, he is in his Citadel in the very heart of the city. So it, it is definitely the city of the gods yeah. um, in that regard, for sure. When you mentioned it being a massive city, I was going to say, so it's Mega City 1, except it's not a hellhole. <laughs> yeah, very, very much so. It's even got towers, like with a capital T. Um, you know, really, really large uh, um, structures that that whole families spend their entire lives in there. You know, never, never having to leave. They're pretty self-contained little cities on their own. Given all, given all that, have you guys given thought to to? And maybe, maybe this was a stretch goal that I did that I didn't see, but. Have you given have you given thought to some sort of divine domain or some sort of holding within the within the city that players could that players could could achieve? Oh, like like uh, um, getting their own seat at the pantheon table kind of thing. 
That is that is one possibility, but mm -hmm. I, I'm more leaning to how in in say old school D and D at a certain level you would be you would you would get a holding and would have like a castle or a wizard's tower with with um, followers and the like. Sure, sure. You know, I think that's going to be at the discretion of whoever is doing the storytelling. I mean, there's definitely real estate in the city. You know, the players all have a place where they live, be it an apartment or, you know, a penthouse or like an established um, um, temple, perhaps, that they could that they could live in. Um, you know, it's it's that's all going to be up to whoever's bringing it to their table. You know, we like to leave that pretty open ended uh, as far as what you can achieve. Now, with the, within the, within that, when it comes to writing out the uh, the garden, do you do you have it planned that 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 it will be sectioned off into di into different um, districts with their own feel? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there are there are ten districts in the city. Ten is a very important number in the game. There are ten uh, clade members and. Um, 10 is very auspicious so there are 10 districts the city is sort of broken up like a if you look at it from above it kind of looks like like a pie you know there are wedges of different districts mm -hmm. and each one is very different from the others which means that there's a good chance that whatever sort of setting that you are looking for as a table you're going to be able to find somewhere within the shining garden there's very very high tech areas there's very low like low tech areas more countryside -y kind of places in it um super densely populated in some parts there's like a district that's basically just a bunch of debauchery and gambling and there's one that has you know all of the rich kids it's there's a lot of things that you can you can sort of spin the wheel if you will and go Today we're going to be in this district, and it's going to be all robots. Mm -hmm. Now, now I'm, gu I'm guessing throughout each each district, you'll have a set of story seeds to give to give AGM ideas. Yeah, well, we'll have not um, not so much direct story seeds, but we will have uh locations within the district and like prominent npcs and things along those lines you know each of the districts are going to have a few pages in the book and artwork and things like that so i think it'll be enough for a storyteller to piece together some some really amazing uh adventures mm -hmm. and i guess i guess story seeds wasn't the right word I, the what i should have said instead was rumors Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. We could probably have just like a, uh, just like a list of prompts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Not anything to be to actually follow through on, but ju but just I just ideas to potentially sure. throw at a GM that they can use or not use. Oh. now with the, with that in mi with that in mind. On the Kickstarter page, you talk about guidelines for customizing weapons, armor, and gear. And while I did see some ge some gear tagged um, wonders, I'm curious how I'm curious how far that customization goes. So that is uh, one of the one of the nice things uh, I think about a, a large portion of the game is even even the the weapons and armor falls under. Um, uh, under the the full customization options basically we have very simple rules for how weapons as a as a generic kind of term and like armor as a generic kind of term function mechanically and then the design of all of those things is up to the player so you can really have anything that you want to to make the the theme of your god all match up and be fine you know and it's and it's easy to decide on those things without needing to do a lot of hunting in game for what they are or anything like that you know if you decide that you want to be the god of the ocean and you want a trident you can have a trident you know you're you're gonna purchase a weapon that does a certain amount of damage and then that weapon can be whatever it is that you want it to be i i can certainly get behind that now i realize that stretch goals might 
might put a monkey wrench into this kind of thing, but what are you guys shooting for as far as a um, page count? Mm, sure. Um, uh, per, between 250 and 275 mm. is kind of kind of that zone before any stretch goals happen. Mm -hmm. And I did I did see that a few that that you have a, that you have a few um, a few written out in terms of mo in terms of modules. Um, yes. Now, given given the module experience and the experience with playtesting, what what would you say were some of the big takeaways that you ha that you had and some of the big learning experiences from playtesting the game at conventions or whatnot? For me, one of the biggest things that I noticed was just that it's just how much players enjoy character creation. You know, it's turned out to just be really deeply fun for everybody to sit down at the table and figure out what they want to be the god of. Um, that has definitely been the like truly enjoyable for a lot of the people. Yeah, and that the players will always come up with something more clever than you have planned for in the module. Because this is such an open system, it's like putting us all in a sandbox and then going, do whatever you want. Um, and so they've always worked within the bounds of like building their roads, but it's always been stuff that I, you know, it was surprising every session. Somebody would do something, even if they were playing the same pre-generated character, they would be playing them completely differently. And it's, it was always really cool to see how far characters could be stretched by player in uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time of this recording, you guys are you guys are at um, twelve thousand and change, and congratulations on that. Thank, Thank you. you. It's very um, exciting. What are you guys shooting for as far as a release window? Hmm. I think our our release uh, date is set there for April of twenty twenty four. Um, basically it gives us 18 months after the conclusion of the Kickstarter. Um, and most of that is just me being paranoid about printing times. Um, cause getting anything printed right now is really just a crapshoot. You know, it's, it, it's taking months to get things printed. Um, but, but our goal is to, you know, we'll finish the book as quickly as we possibly can. And then everybody who's, who's. Uh, back to the Kickstarter at a print level is also getting the PDF, and so that means everybody who wants the book PDF or print will be able to get, at the very least, the PDF version as soon as we're done with it. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that we've got the time to get the art in there, get the art correct and just looking great and all the mechanics dialed in and, and things like that. But um, at this point, I would say the game from a writing point of view is, is about 80% written. Um, you know, it's just expanding a couple of sections, uh, mainly like the bestiary. We only put a little bit into that quick start guide. Um, we'll probably have 40 or 50, um, more bestiary entries. Um, you know, just, just, uh, uh, expanding the book, making, making sure it's, it's as good as it can be, but we'll get that done as quick as we can and get that out well before print copies for sure. And I will certainly be keeping a close eye on how it de on how it develops, as I keep an eye on just about everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having us. Thank you so much. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>